Hello and welcome to Smarter, a podcast by clinicians for clinicians, brought to you by Marta, an Australian leader in healthcare for more than a century. My name is Glenn Minturn and I'll be your host for season two of Smarter as we meet some of our clinicians and deep dive into specialty areas from across Mackay and Townsville. Today, I'm coming to you from Kutharinga, the land on which this podcast is recorded. And I'm joined by Dr. Sunaya Biggie Malloy, cardiologist at Marta Private Hospital, Townsville. As well as being a consultant cardiologist at both Marta Private Hospital, Townsville and Townsville University Hospital, Dr. Malloy is a senior lecturer at James Cook University and an examiner with the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Dr. Malloy specialises in multimodality imaging with expertise in complex echocardiology and manages a wide range of cardiac diseases including valvular heart disease, heart failure, simple and complex coronary artery disease and more. Today he's joining us to discuss atrial fibrillation, mitral valve repairs and the impacts of an ageing population. Marta. Caring for the community for more than a century. Innovators in health, education and research. Home to world-class clinicians. State-of-the-art facilities. High-quality, patient-centred care. Australia's largest and leading maternity provider. Turning scientific discoveries Educating into life-changing the nurses, leading leading We are Marta. We are Marta. We are Marta. This is Smarter. Dr. Malloy, welcome to Smarter. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Do you mind if I call you Biggie? Call me Biggie anytime. <laughs> Twice on Sunday. Twice on Sundays. <laughs> Biggie, let's talk about technology. It's obviously improving cardiac care. How are ultrasounds aiding specifically in procedures such as the mitral valve repairs? I really like that question because for me, it really ringing definitely home because ultrasound or echocardiography is the core of what I do as a subspecialty in cardiology. And um, it has, in my opinion, really revolutionized what we do. Specifically for mitral valve repair and, and valve intervention in general. We'll talk about mitral valve in particular, just so that we can put things in context. Yeah. So if you're going to look at a valve, like the mitral valve, one of the things that first you got to determine is obviously its severity. Um, uh, is it is it stenose blocked? Is it regurgitant or leaking? The moment you made the decision that it needs to be replaced, especially the ones that are leaking, you got to ask yourself one simple question: Is it repairable? Is it replaceable? And ultrasound plays a huge role because now the modalities that we can we we have can actually give a 3D visualization wow. of the valve before the surgeon even opens the patient's chest. So the surgeon can have a look at that and say, "This is the area that is uh, that is damaged. This is what it looks like. This is how complex it is. This is." how I predict will happen when I open the patient. Therefore, the, the, that planning can happen even before the, 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 the patient's uh So you get to open. see so much more before you even start going in and doing any operation. Definitely, well. because, you know, it tells you how much is leaking. It tells you how the tissue looks like the same way the, the, the surgeon looks at it. And therefore, the surgeon can do planning, and then they can know whether it's repairable or replaceable. The Pilot Heart Health Check launched by the Australian Heart Foundation this year is already being hailed a success. The Australian Journal of General Practice revealed 42,000 at-risk patients across Australia received an invitation from their GP over text message to come in for a heart health check, which led to a 14-fold increase in heart health checks compared to control practices. The pilot is the largest cardiovascular disease screening trial of its kind in Australian general practice and has the potential to pave the way for structured CVD screening into the future. From what I understand, there's a benefit to repairing rather than replacing if you possibly can. It is, it's huge. Obviously, the, 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 the cohort has to be the right cohort for replacement. So if you're the right cohort, and people that you might even think about, they are the ones that you really want to replace that valve. If you've got 
young patients, especially women who are childbearing, you can just imagine you really want to repair the, the valve yeah. so that they don't have to be on blood thinners. If you've got um, elderly patient who got bleeding risk, you or they 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 um they can't take blood thinners. You want to repair them. Also, repair really maintains the original structure of the valve because the valve is not only if you can imagine a door a door has the door and has the frame yes so the valve has the leaflets which are the door the fra- the, the 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 annulus which is the frame the annulus that frame when you repair is maintained and it does add to the structure of the heart it just acts add to the functionality of the heart. Therefore, you maintain that. So your hemodynamics or your physiology, your ability for the heart to pump better is maintained. What about in recovery? Is there any difference? Is it better recovery if it is repaired as repaired to uh, replacing, which may take longer to recover? Is there much difference in that area? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it, 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 it all depends. It all depends on whether, you know, they, they do what you call minimally invasive uh, right. repair uh, or it's an open um, uh, open heart surgery. But nowadays, just imagine that because of the expertise, the technology, patients are in hospital for four to five days. They're no longer languishing in hospital for weeks. Yeah. So therefore, really, whether you repair or you replace, we've seen these patients recover very well within a short period of time and getting out of hospital within four days. And we're talking about you know intervening on 85-year-olds, 90-year-olds are are patients. So therefore, it's been remarkable whether you're repairing or replacing the valve. We we touched on it briefly, but can you give us a a bit more of an insight into what would the condition be where replacing is going to be much better for the patient than repairing? So therefore, a lot of the valves, basically, you've got two conditions. You've got what you call uh, primary, you, you might have a primary leaky valve, which is the problem with the leaflets. You might be uh, the, the problem with the leaflets, but the problem with the structures that that sort of you know support the, the leaflets. So therefore, if you've got just the problem with the leaflets and the leaflets, they still look very good. They still look very natural. They're not calcified. Uh, there are no other things that just makes the, the, the repair complicated. And then you are more likely to repair. So I'm looking at relatively younger patients. In cardiology, when you say younger, you mean less than the age of 65, yes. age of 60. Um, and then if you are older, you are more likely to have a lot more calcium, both around the valve, on the leaflets, and sometimes even on the structures that support the, 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 the leaflets. So therefore, the more calcification you have, the more it's difficult to repair that valve because the valve might fall apart. So the older you are, the less likely that you're going to have a repair. And then a replacement is very easy for older patients because it's just a tissue valve. You still negate in putting patients on blood thinners anyway. The reason why we are so pedantic about re- repairing younger patients is because we, we, we want them to avoid anticoagulation, especially childbearing, you know, contact sports. You know, there's a lot of non-compliance in younger people. You don't want to put tissue valve because the tissue valve might degenerate and fall apart in five, 10 years. You want to put a mechanical valve. That brings its own issues. In Australia, there were 12,000 heart valve repair or replacement procedures performed on patients admitted to hospital in 2020 and 2021. The age standardised rate of heart valve repair or replacement procedures was 52 per 100,000 population in males and 26 per 100,000 population in females. So, Biggie, we've recently seen the commencement of early appendage closures through MARTA in Townsville. Can you tell us why this kind of procedure is important for those patients who may not be able to take blood thinners? The left atrial appendage is an out pouch that really can be so deep that the blood going in and out of it, if the heart goes into what you call or the rhythm, which is the electrical activity, goes into what you call atrial fibrillation, which is a chaotic 
production of electrical impulses that really come out of the left atrium. Therefore, the flow of blood through the left atrium becomes slow. It's like a slow flowing river. What does it do? What does it do? It forms sludge. And then when it forms sludge, that sludge is thrombus. It goes to the brain. It causes stroke. It goes to the kidneys, kills the kidneys, intestine. It kills the intestine. So the appendage really is a very, very important area where clots will form if the patient went to the atrial fibrillation. And the effectiveness of the emptying capacity of that, the, the left atrium is impaired. Yep. So therefore, for most patients, we put them on blood thinners. Okay. Yep. So the blood thinners that we use nowadays, since around maybe 2010, have been what we call NOEX. We used to call them NOEX because they were novel then. Now we call them DOEX because they're no longer novel. Now they're just direct acting uh, anticoagulants. Um, warfarin really doesn't have a role to play nowadays, only in specific uh, uh, areas that we can talk about it later. So the left atrial appendage, for most people, we don't worry about it because we can put them on blood thinners and we reduce stroke uh, by 80%. But for those patients that we really can't put them on blood thinners for many different reasons, therefore the left atrial appendage, we can close it in this day and age. All right, well, let's dive a little bit further into mm. that early appendage closure. So atrial fibrillation seems to be common within the community. Yes. What are the mortality and morbidity figures associated with this area? So therefore, if you look at atrial fibrillation, really is a, is an epidemic, okay? In the sense- You call it an epidemic? I call it an epidemic. Why? Because it used to be a disease of old age or a disease of aging, but now because of lifestyle issues that permeate in our society, now we see this problem in very, very, very young people. When I say young people, I mean in the 20s, in the 30s. Really? Because it's tracking obesity, because it's tracking sedentary lifestyle, is tracking lack of exercise, is tracking sleep apnea, which are really, really permeating hugely. We've got a, a huge cohort of obviously low socioeconomic populations and societies. And then you talk about determinants of health. And we see atrial fibrillation both as a disease and as a symptom. And atrial fibrillation causes mortality and morbidity. It causes more, it causes death, it causes disability. That is why really we become so, so, so pedantic about looking for it, treating it, preventing its sequelae. And in terms of the numbers, it's around around 2 to 4 percent in the overall population is funded around 12 percent of cardiovascular admissions and if you have a stroke because of AF it's much more debilitating because it's thrombus in the heart that just showers your brain. Let's talk about treatment options. What do the different treatment options look like for the different cohorts of patients in this area? So therefore the, the, the two parts. So first if the patient has atrial fibrillation you got to be looking at here we talk about what would atrial fibrillation do to the patient. So we 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 really really want to prevent prevent them from having a stroke for reasons that we alluded to prior. We want them to not have heart failure, which actually is one of the things that happen even more often than stroke. They say they say they say score that we use to predict the risk of stroke in individual patients. Therefore, it's called CHASVA score. It's an acronym. It's got it's got components that says it's either got diabetes or stroke. You old. You've had a heart heart failure, heart attack, and all other things. And then we calculate that if you're young. Anyone who scores less than two, we are less likely to put them on blood thinners. So blood thinners are usually the NOEX uh, or warfarin for, for those ones that are specific population. And then LA appendix closure, which has been a technology that at the MARA uh, is being introduced by one of our electrophysiologists. And this is an option for those patients that really were difficult to manage, that could not be on warfarin, could not be on NOEX, because every time you put them on blood thinners, they bleed. Now there are devices that we can actually 
plug the LA appendage and reduce the stroke risk at the same rate as if they were on uh, blood thinners. So this is very exciting for the matter. This is very exciting for the Townsville population in general. Let's talk a little bit about the patient's journey. What does it look like for someone who requires that early appendage closure as opposed to perhaps taking warfarin? So therefore, the, for, for those patients that can be on blood thinners, and remember, the, these, these patients are the ones that, you know, either we put them on blood thinners and they bled, um, uh, or uh, they, you know, have to have, they have, let's say, malignancy, liver disease. They got all sorts of things that negates blood thinners. So they they still have very high risk of stroke. Unfortunately, the patients that have the high risk of bleeding have the highest risk of stroke. Therefore, really, you are in a very tenuous situation. Yeah. So the journey for these patients usually, obviously, you got conversations with them, and the conversation will be around, you know, what are the pro and cons of putting them on blood thinners, and then that would have been declared. What well, that would have declared itself, and then you go through what are the options for that LA appendix uh, closure. Unfortunately, not every patient will qualify for that for different reasons. And then if that patient qualifies for that, obviously you will link them up with the electrophysiologist or the interventionists who did the procedure. And then they'll go through what the procedure involves because these are invasive procedures. So every invasive procedure carries risks, albeit remote and small, but the risks do exist. And then therefore, and the patient needs to be on some kind of anti or much more less potent blood thinners after the procedure just so that the body can build tissue over that 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 um that um uh, closure device so that it doesn't form clot on it so therefore those are the 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 conversations that need to be had and most of these patients are older, therefore invasive procedures carry a little bit of a risk to them as well. But on balance, these technologies are very important. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare revealed that as at June 2020, more than one in six Australians were aged 65 and over, accounting for 16% of the total population. It's expected this percentage will increase to at least 21% by 2066. In 2018, Australian women aged 65 could expect to live to 83, while men aged 65 could expect to live to 80. So, Biggie, we're an ageing population. We know that. It's, uh, it's one of those things that we can't get past. It's actual, it's real, it is out there. So I suppose the question is, are you now seeing an increasing number of North Queenslanders who are presenting with heart conditions? Yes, and, and, and it's an exciting time to be a cardiologist, in my opinion, because we've got this plethora of technology um, uh, that's keeping people alive for longer. We've got treatments that are keeping people alive for longer. We've got better access accessibility. Um, now, obviously, in, in Queensland, we also have to grapple with geography. Yeah. But outside that, uh, conditions that will, you know, render people dead in six months. Now, you know, patients are living for more than five years, more than six years, more than five years, more than 10 years, more than 15 years. And we talk about heart failure, you talk about heart attacks, you talk about even strokes, stroke prevention and all that. Obviously, at the end of that, patients are, people are living longer. Yeah. They're getting into their 80s, into their 90s. Even into their 80s and 90s, we're still intervening on these patients, okay? So the the older population is obviously growing and growing rapidly. How much of the issue when it does come to, to the heart is fully age-based as opposed to what you might see from other indicators that people might be with their lifestyle? Is age a major factor now or is it the other things that go with what we do in our lifestyle? So, so heart disease in general are a manifestation of aging. Right. By and large, unfortunately, and I and and you that will really make sense in the nineties, maybe in the eighties, in the seventies, but now we see 
people having heart attacks in the 30s, in the 40s. And obviously, a great proportion is still in the in the in the elderly population. Yeah. You know, in the seventies, in the eighties, in the sixties. But we're looking after more and more younger people having heart attacks, having strokes, having AF, as I alluded to before, and everything else that emanates out of that. Therefore, you can just imagine if I got a forty-year-old who has a heart attack today, and you know the biggest risk factor for a heart attack. It's a previous one. Right. So if nothing changes, I can tell you they'll be back with a bigger heart attack within the next five years. And therefore, we talk about heart failure. So I have to look after them now when they come in with heart failure, which is a much more malignant disease, much more resource intensive. And therefore, you can just see how that keeps eating into the system. What about the genetic side of that then? Is that different now because our lifestyles are different? Are you seeing differences when it comes to the genetic indicators or has that stayed much the same? Yes, yeah, so so there are two parts. So genetics, there's nothing you can do about genetics. You can't modify genetics. You can't modify whether you are male or female. Um, you can't modify whether you are black or white. You can't modify um, all other aspects that are to do with how you were born. Yep. But most of those genetics, remember, genetic predisposition needs to be switched on. And it gets switched on by lifestyle. Right. That is why you've got mother, father, never had diabetes. It's not that they don't have the, ge the genes. And the children, all of them have diabetes because they switched on the genes through lifestyle. Yeah. So therefore... Be aware of the genetics in your family. If you got premature heart disease, um, that you got you know males, you know dying from heart attacks in their fifties, women dying from heart attacks in their fifties, early sixties. You got to be cognizant of that. You got to have a GP. You got to have conversation. You got to look after yourself because you're going to switch on your genes, and then that trajectory you can go along or you can change it. That's really important. Let's talk about for those patients who might be a little further afield than Townville, they have limited access to transport and recovering from a, a cardiac event. What sort of options are there for those people to do their rehabilitation at home? So one of the things that um, has been an opportunity for me working in Townsville is being able to travel the breadth of our catchment area that takes us all the way to the Gulf. And it's a big area. It's huge. <laughs> uh, last, just last week, I was in Konkari, uh, Bergtown, I was in Dumiji. So you can imagine if you have a heart attack in Dumiji, obviously, you know, time is muscle. Yep. You know, you got to get to a place where you can be intervened upon uh, very, very quickly. Otherwise, every minute that passes, you lose that. So those patients that we are able to bring, we are able to treat, and then they, they, they go back. Even if you are in Charles Towers, eh, that rehabilitation is very, very important. And one of the things that have been exciting, especially with the Mara Hospital, is be able to institute or be part of the pilot project of virtual rehabilitation. So that has allowed patients through the smartphone, through application, to be able to access rehabilitation um, uh, uh, without having to be physically at the Mara Hospital, um, for instance. So that goes to you know, being able to have education about diet, exercise, uh, quit smoking, control of blood pressure, cholesterol, and, and just having support, even, you know, mental health and all that, that's very, very important. Obviously, if you can physically be in the rehabilitation unit at the matter, for instance, that's that great. is fantastic. But that virtual uh, rehabilitation has given opportunity to patients that otherwise wouldn't have. Rehabilitation saves lives, improves uh, outcomes, improves compliance, uh, and, and also it obviously uh, reduces the risk of the next event and also improves engagement. It's amazing time. All right, just before we wrap up, I'm excited to introduce a little segment we call The Checkup. Let's have a look. So, Biggie, we're going to wrap up. We've heard a lot about uh, your expertise, but we want to learn a little bit more about 
you right now. This is where we do our quick fire questions. Are you ready for this? I am. <laughs> One ready, I say. <laughs> You'll be glad you went to the gym early this morning as we get into these. All right, we've got some questions. We're going to go into quick fire. Let's see how okay. you go with this. Yeah. How would you describe your handwriting? My handwriting is the most terrible in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> you don't have to be that honest. You can ask the nurses. <laughs> All right. What would be your top piece of advice for a medical student? Stay the course is hard. Sometimes there is whipping and gnashing of teeth. It gets better. <laughs> it gets better. It gets better. All right, this one. I love this one. Have you ever been on a plane where they've announced, is there a doctor on board? Yes, I have. I mean, the most memorable one is that I had just seen the guy in Manaza. He was on the plane. I knew he was not going to do well. And then uh, I unleashed my registrar to help him. <laughs> I stayed back on the seat because I was full of wine. <laughs> what time do you wake up in the morning? 5 a.m. club is what I believe in. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. And then off to the gym? Off to the gym and then that's the day starts. All right. One last question for you. Mm -hmm. If you weren't a doctor, what would you be? You know what? I've never played piano, but I think somewhere in there I'm a good Pianist. <laughs> Let's see those piano fingers. <laughs> Look at him. Away he goes. Biggie, thank you so much for joining us on Smarter. Thank you, sir. So for our listeners at home in the car or having a well-deserved break between patients, thank you for tuning in. For our next Townsville episode, join me as I catch up with Marta General and bariatric surgeon Dr. Scott Whiting on treatment options for weight loss and when medication may not be enough. See you next time on Smarter.